Chapter 20 of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Trap Shuts. In one matter, Lou Hervey had acted none too quickly. Shorty and Little Joe arrived at the corral in time to find Mary Ann in the very act of leading out her pony. They told her firmly and gently that the horse must go back, and when she defied them, they astonished her by simply removing her hand from the lead rope and taking the horse away. In vain she stormed and threatened. In vain, at length, she broke into tears. Either of them would have given an arm to serve her. But in fact, they considered they were at that moment rendering the greatest service possible. They were saving her from herself. She fled back to the house again, finally, and threw herself face down on her bed in an agony of dread and helplessness and shame. Shame because, from Little Joe's brief remarks, she gathered that Hervey had already spread the news of her confession. But shame and fear were suddenly forgotten. She found herself sitting wide-eyed on the edge of the bed, repeating over and over in a shaking voice, I have to get there, I have to get there. But how utterly Hervey had tied her hands. She could not budge to warn Paris or to join him. The long night wore away with Marianne crouched at the window, straining her eyes towards the corrals. Night was the proper time for such a thing as the murder of Red Paris. They would not dare, she felt, for all their numbers, to face him in the honest sunshine. So she peered eagerly towards the shadowy outlines of the barns and sheds until at length a wan moon rose and gave her blessed light. But no one approached the corrals from the bunkhouse, and at length, when the dawn began to grow, she fell asleep. It was a sleep filled with nightmares, and before the sun was well up, she was awake again and at watch. Mid-morning came, yet still none of the men rode out to their ordinary work. There could be only one meaning. They were held back to join the expedition. They were at this very moment, perhaps, cleaning their guns in the bunkhouse. Noon brought no action. They trooped cheerfully towards the house in answer to the noon gong. She heard them laughing and jesting. What cold-blooded fiends they were to be able to conduct themselves in this manner when they intended to do a murder before the day had ended. And indeed, it was only for this meal they seemed to have planned to wait. Before the afternoon was well begun, there was saddling and mounting, and then Hervey, Little Joe, Shorty, McIntosh, and Scotty climbed onto their mounts and jogged out towards the east. Her heart leaped with only a momentary hope when she saw the direction, but instantly she undeceived herself. They would, of course, swing north as soon as they were well out of sight from the house, and then they would head for the shack on the mountainside, aiming to reach it at about the fall of twilight. And what could she do to stop them? She ran out through the patio to the front of the house. The dust cloud already had swallowed the individual forms of the riders. And, turning to the left, she saw McGuire and Hastings lolling in full view near the corrals. With consummate tact, Hervey had chosen those of his men who were the oldest, the hardest, the least liable to be melted by her persuasions. Moaning, she turned back and looked east. The dust cloud was dwindling every minute, and without hope she cast another glance towards the corrals. Evidently, the men agreed that it was unnecessary for two of them to stay in the heat of the sun to prevent her from getting at a horse. Hastings had turned his back and was strolling towards the bunkhouse. McGuire was perched on a stump, rolling a cigarette and grinning broadly towards her. He would be a hard man to handle, but at least there was more hope than before. One man was not so hard to manage as two, each shaming the other into indifference. She went slowly towards McGuire, turning again to see the dust cloud roll out of view over a distant hill. In that cloud of dust, Hervey kept the pace down to an easy dog-trot. From mid-afternoon until evening, 
for he did not intend to expose himself primarily and his men in the second place to the accurate gun of Red Jim in broad daylight, was a comfortable stretch in which to make the journey to the shack on the mountainside. Like a good general, he kept the minds of his followers from growing tense by deftly turning the talk on the way to other topics as they swung off the East Trail towards Gloucesterville and journeyed due north over the rolling foothills. There was only one chance in three that he could have deceived the girl by his first direction, but that chance was worth taking. He had a wholesome respect for the mental powers of Oliver Jordan's daughter, and he by no means wished to drive her frantic in the effort to get to Paris with her warning. Of course, it would be impossible for her to wheedle McGuire and Hastings into letting her have a horse, but if she should... Here Hervey abruptly turned his thoughts in a new direction. The old one led to results too unpleasant. In the meantime, as they wore out the miles and the day turned towards sunset time, the cheery conversation which little Joe had led among the riders fell away. They were coming too close to the time and place of action. What the action must be was only too easy to guess. It was simply impossible to imagine Red Paris submitting to an order to leave. He had already defied their assembled forces once. He would certainly make the attempt again. Of course, odds of five to one were too great for even the most courageous and skillful fighter to face. But he might do terrible damage before the end. And it was a solemn procession which wound up the hillside through the darkening trees, until at length, at a word from Hervey, they dismounted, tethered their horses here and there where there was sufficient grass to occupy them and keep them from growing nervous and neighing, and then started out again on foot. At this point Hervey took the lead. For that matter, he had never been lacking in sheer animal courage, and now he wound up the path with his long colt in his hand, ready to shoot, and shoot to kill. Once or twice small sounds made him pause uneasy, but his progress was fairly steady until he came to the edge of the little clearing where the shack stood. There was no sign of life about it. The shack seemed deserted. Thick darkness filled its doorway and the window, though the rest of the clearing was still permeated with a faint afterglow of the sunset. "'He ain't here,' said Little Joe softly, as he came to the side of the watchful foreman. "'Don't be too sure,' said the other. "'I'd trust this Paris and take about as many chances with him as I would with a rattler in a six-by-six six room. Maybe he's in there playing possum, waiting for us to make a break across the clearing. That'd be fine for Red Jim, damn his heart. Little Joe peered back at the anxious faces of the others as they came up the path one by one. He did not like to be one of so large a party held up by a single man. In fact, Joe was a good deal of a warrior himself. He was new to the Valley of the Eagles, but there were other parts of the mountain desert where his fame was spread broadcast. There were even places where sundry officers of the law would have been glad to lay hands upon him. Well, quoth Joe, we'll give him a chance. If he ain't a fighting man, but just a plain murderer, we'll let him show it. And so saying, he stepped boldly out from the sheltering darkness of the trees and strolled towards the hut, an immense and awesome figure in the twilight. Lou Hervey followed at once. It would not do to be outdared by one of his crew in a crisis as important as this. But for all his haste, the long strides of Joe had brought him to the door of the hut many yards in the lead, and he disappeared inside. Presently his big voice boomed. He ain't here. Plum vanished. They gathered in the hut at once. "'Where's he gone?' asked the foreman, scratching his head. "'Maybe he ain't acting as big as he talked,' said Shorty. "'Maybe he slid over the mountains.' "'Strike a light, somebody,' commanded the foreman. Three or four sulfur matches were scratched at the same moment on trousers made tight by cocking the knee up. Each match glimmered through sheltering fingers 
with a dull blue light for a moment, and then as the sulfur was exhausted and the flame caught the wood, the hands opened and directed shafts of light here and there. The whole cabin was dimly illumined for a moment, while man after man thrust his burning match towards something he had discovered. "'Here's his blankets, all mussed up. Here's a pair of boots. Here's the frying pan right on the stove.' They wandered here and there, lighting new matches, until little Joe spoke. "'No use, boys,' he declared. "'Paris has hopped out. Wise gent at that. He's seen the game was too big for him, and I don't blame him for quitting. Ain't nothing here that he'd come after. Them boots are wore out. The blankets and the cooking things he got from the ranch. Look at the way the blankets are piled up. Shows he quit in a rush and started away. When a gent figures on coming back, he tidies things up a little when he leaves in the morning. No boys, he's gone. Main thing to answer is, if he ain't left the valley, why ain't he here in his shack now? Maybe he's hunting that damn hoss, suggested the foreman, but his voice was weak with uncertainty. Hunting Alcatraz after dark, queried little Joe. There was no answer possible. The last glow of twilight was fading to deep night. The trees on the edge of the clearing seemed to grow taller and blacker each moment. Certainly, if it were well-nigh impossible to hunt the stallion effectively in daylight, it was sheer madness to hunt him at night. Every moment they waited in the cabin, the certainty that Paris had left the valley grew greater. It showed in their voices, for every man had spoken softly at first, as though for fear the spirit of the inhabitant of the shack might drift near unseen and overhear. Now their words came loud, disturbing, and startling Hervey in the midst of his thought, as he continued wandering about the cabin, lighting match after match, striving in vain to find something which would reawaken his hopes. But there was nothing of enough worth to induce Paris to return, and finally Hervey gave up. "'We'll start on,' he said at length. "'You boys ride along. I'll give the place another look.' As a matter of fact, he merely wished to be alone, and he was dimly pleased as they sauntered off through the trees, their voices coming more and more vaguely back to him, until the far-off rattle of hoofs began. The last he heard of them was a high-pitched laugh. It irritated Hervey. It floated back to him, thin and small, like mockery. And indeed, he had failed miserably. How great was his failure, he could hardly estimate in a moment and he needed quiet to sum up his losses. First of all, he had hopelessly alienated the girl, and while offending her, he had failed to serve the rancher. For Red Jim Paris, driven by force from the ranch, would surely return again to exact payment in full for the treatment he had received. The whole affair was a hopeless muddle. He had staked everything on his ability to trap Paris and destroy him, thereby piling upon the shoulders of Oliver Jordan a burden of gratitude which the rancher could never repay. But now that Paris was footloose, he became a danger, imperiling not only Jordan, but Hervey himself. The trap had closed, and closed on nothing. The future presented to Hervey stark ruin. So enthralling was the gloom of these thoughts that the foreman did not hear the thudding hoofs of a horse which trotted up through the trees. Not until the horse and rider appeared in the clearing was Hervey roused, and then, in the first glance, by the size and the tossing head of the approaching pony, he recognized the horse of Red Paris. End of chapter 20